The Chinese had a very culturally important system of government that had everyone respect the emperor like a god. When the British arrived, they completely ignored the social norms that had lasted for past millennia, so the Chinese made them trade with less rights than local merchants. The British didn't like this, so they started illegally selling opium to the Chinese people, and got angry when the emperor asked them to stop. I'm that one Prussian, and today we're reviewing the first opium war. Welcome back to History Review, where I look at bits of history and then review them at the end of the video on a scale of 0 to 14. So this is going to be a series of two videos on the Opium Wars, this first one covering the first and the next one covering the second. I'm also probably going to butcher all the Mandarin and Cantonese names throughout this video, so uh, sorry for that. And before we get to the war itself, a little background on Sino-European trade. In the mid-1500s, the Spanish conquered the Philippines, which greatly increased Sino-European trade due to the newly gained proximity. The Chinese demanded that all payments be made in silver due to the influx of silver from Spain because of their colonies in South America. And as the empires of the world got even bigger, they had to mint more coins for domestic use, and thus had less to pay China for goods. Then, the British government realized that by selling opium, they could get a lot more silver. So the British East India Company started growing opium and selling it to merchants, who then sold it to the Chinese. In the start, the Chinese government was fine with this because the British sold the opium for silver, which they would use to buy even more tea. But then the people started getting addicted to it and the stability of the country started to plummet. So they banned opium. But did that stop the British? No way in hell. At the turn of the century, the population across the western world started wanting a more liberalized trade system, this radical thing called free trade. So quite a few countries started adopting policies to liberalize trade, causing other nations to have access to colonial British goods such as silver, causing the British to have less silver to trade with China. In addition to this, the British adopted the gold standard in 1821, meaning they had to mint even more standardized coins, causing them to have even less silver, meaning even less tea. In 1834, a group of prominent merchants and reformers got together and said to the British government, So you know that free trade thing? Yeah? Well, how about you stop that thing that makes us need a charter from one of your colonies to smuggle opium, <clears throat> trade legal goods with the Chinese? And the British government said sure, so the merchants didn't need to get a charter to trade, meaning even more opium. Then a guy named Lord William John Napier was sent to China as the superintendent of trade in China and was instructed to talk with the Chinese about the opium trade and to follow the Chinese regulations of not speaking directly to any Chinese officials. But did he follow the regulations? No. No he didn't. He sent a letter directly to the Viceroy of Canton which was rejected with an order to spend British trade. In response, Napier told two Royal Navy vessels to fire on Chinese fortifications. And they did. And then war happened. Oh, wait, no, it didn't, because Napier got sick with typhus and died. How anticlimactic. By 1838, the British were selling about 14,000 tons of opium to China each year, and oh boy, is that a lot of opium. So much so that the Imperial Commissioner of China, who basically had the same powers as the Emperor, Lin Zhu, finally noticed that in the 20 years of opium being banned in China, not a single infraction had been filed for the selling of opium by Chinese officials, even though opium had quite obviously continued being sold. Lin wrote a letter to Queen Victoria asking her to stop endorsing the opium trade and cited the morality of selling drugs on an intercontinental scale. But as we know, the Brits didn't care much about morality. The letter was supposedly lost on the way to the UK. Lin threw a temper tantrum because of this and burned all the opium he could find. In July of 1839, two British sailors got really drunk and beat some poor farmer to death. Charles Elliot, the new superintendent of trade in China, ordered the arrest of the two, but Lin wanted Elliot to give him the two guys, presumably so he could hang them. Elliot didn't because he didn't want them getting hanged. In response to this horrid act of obstruction of justice, Lin banned the sale of food to the British. Anyways, the British were banned from landing ships in Macau or Hong Kong, and by August 30th, there were 60 British ships floating off and around the coast of China. When a British warship arrived, the HMS Volage. Getting more and more hungry, Elliot sent an ultimatum to the Chinese, saying, give us food or we make our big guns go bang bang. And looking at how history played out, you can probably guess what happened. 
By the end of the day, a battle had broken out and a fleet of Chinese junks had retreated, with quite a few being destroyed. Now there's this group of Christians called the Quakers, who were quite interesting, but the one thing that's important right now is that they refused to deal in opium. The Chinese knew this, so when a Quaker trading vessel was in Canton, they were allowed some trade rights to prevent other ships from following suit. Elliot ordered a blockade of British trade? Some trade minister, huh? Anyways, another ship tried to get into Canton, so the blockade fired a warning shot for the ship to go away, which it didn't. The Chinese saw this and sent 16 war junks out to protect the vessel, and four of them were sunk when two modern British warships fought against them. This guy Palmerston, the British foreign minister, sent letters to both Elliot and the Emperor of China. To the Emperor, he said something along the lines of, Stop! You violated the law! Pay the court a fine or serve your sentence! And to Elliot, he sent a list of objectives with the war, mainly being the terms of peace, which were along the lines of make China liberalize, because who cares about their stability, get some better trading rights, steal some islands, get some money, and get out. And so the war happened. Neither the British or Chinese were actually prepared for a war, as the Chinese had taken most of their fortifications away from Canton and other key ports, as they believed the British had been successfully expelled, which they weren't. The Royal Navy wasn't prepared as the majority of the fleet was in the Mediterranean because of the recent Oriental Crisis, but by mid-1840, the Royal Marines and British fleet was ready. The first half of the Expeditionary Force, as it was called, along with four steam-powered gunboats and 25 other boats, told the king to pay for the opium, and the king said no. So they went down to the vital port city of Tucson, used those big naval guns to shoot the governor into submission, and prepared to use it as a base of operations. The garrison then proceeded to get horribly sick, and about one third of the force was put out of fighting condition. The British then split up, sending one fleet south towards Macau and the other fleet north to the Yellow Sea. The fleet that went north had Elliot in it with plans to discuss peace terms. The new imperial commissioner, Kishan, agreed to compensate the British for lost income in the Pearl River, but requested to continue negotiations at said river, and requested for Elliot to kindly remove the fleet of warships in the sea that was bordering some major Chinese cities. So he did. Anyways, the fleet that went south met up with the new, beautiful, strong, technologically advanced gunboat HMS Nemesis, which the Chinese had no effective counter for. They sailed down to Macau and went boom to the Chinese garrison guarding the passage from the mainland to the city, causing a wave of British support in Macau and eventually causing the governor to allow British ships to dock there. While the British were having a hell of a time in the south of China, the Chinese Admiral Guan Tianpei reinforced positions along the Pearl River that would restrict British access. The British proceeded to show up with their big, beautiful, strong, and technologically advanced navy and destroy 11 ships of the southern Chinese fleet and capture the forts that Tianpei had just set up. The Imperial Commissioner, realizing the course of the war and not wanting it to widen in scale, started drafting the Convention of Junpei with Elliot, both of whom wanted the war to end. But did it? No, no it didn't. The Emperor didn't want to cede any land to the British, and Palmerston wanted more said land, because tea. Both the negotiators were dismissed from their positions, but only the Imperial Commissioner was aware of it, as it takes a long time to send a letter from the UK to China. Fighting stopped for about a month, as the British waited to see if trade on the Pearl River was reopened again. Fun fact, it wasn't. The British then used their big, beautiful, strong, and technologically advanced navy to take the remaining forts along the Pearl River, and made preparations to sail downriver to take Canton. Having cleared the Pearl River of resistance, the British started thinking about advancing on Canton. So they did. They captured the 13 factories, which was the only place in Canton where trade happened without too much difficulty and trade was mostly reopened. Until word got around that the king were preparing 50,000 men to retake Canton. The king attack started the night of May 21st and was initially successful in recapturing the 13 factories. The naval attack, on the other hand, didn't go so well. The Chinese had prepared a formation of 200 fire rafts to attack the British ships in Canton, which the British dodged, causing them to hit and set fire to the Cantonese waterfront. Major General Gao, the commander of the expeditionary force, heard of the attack and quickly marched his men up the coast from their positions on the Pearl River and reached Canton by the 25th. His men took the remaining forts and captured the city's heights after which the king proceeded to run away, and the British took full control of the city. 
A few days later, they were paid to retreat behind the forts they took on Pearl River. After their retreat from Canton, the British relocated to Hong Kong, which had been traded for the earlier captured city of Chusan. Elliot wanted to stop military operations, while Major General Gao wanted to capture the city of Amoy and blockade the Yangtze River. There was a brief stop in the fighting while the two argued, but in late July, Elliot was finally informed of his removal and his replacement, Henry Pottinger, shared Gao's more militaristic views on the war. On the 25th of August, the British arrived at Amoy, an important trade city. The fortifications too strong to take purely navally, the Royal Marines were sent in to flank and destroy some of the Chinese defenses, eventually having to take the biggest one that withstood over 12,000 cannonballs getting launched at it. After taking the city, they left, instead setting up a garrison on an island in the middle of the Chui Long River and blockading it. Remember how I said the British traded the occupation of Tucson for Hong Kong? So the British decided they actually wanted Tucson back, so they sailed up there, used their big naval guns and their strange addiction to tea to retake the city. They then took a little stroll to the mainland and took the city of Ningbo, because tea. The Chinese didn't like that reasoning, so they tried to retake it. it didn't go so well for them. And just for good measure, Major General Gao decided to cripple the Chinese economy, so they sailed up the Yangtze, destroyed the emperor's tax barges, and then took the city of Zhejiang, in which the British suffered their highest casualties in any battle of the war. 36 killed. Wow. So many. Anyways, after the capture of the city, the Brits were on the doorstep of the major city in Nanjing. Chinese officials in the city started negotiations with the British, fearing their capture and the city's destruction. These negotiations went on for quite a few weeks until the final treaty was signed, which gave the British Hong Kong Island, opened up four more ports to foreign trade, allowed merchants to trade with whomever they wished in those ports, and made the Chinese pay a total of $21 million over three years. And that brings us to the Second Opium War, a war which I will actually go over in my next video. I'd rate the First Opium War a good 12 of 14. The means that can come out of this highly immoral and unreasonable war are almost limitless. This has the humor that I find good in historical events. Of course, not everything in this war was hilarious, but in hindsight, the reason for it, the casualties, the governments themselves continuously dismissing an appointing minister has, has a certain hilarity. Anyways, thanks for watching, I'm That One Prussian, and this has been History Review.